Welcome to Latter-day Peace Studies presents Come Follow Me. On this podcast, we'll be discussing nonviolent readings of Latter-day Saint scripture. I'm Dan, and I'm joined by my wife and co-host, Marianne. The Latter-day Peace Studies Project is born out of a desire to proclaim peace by providing an opportunity to approach religion, scripture, and relationships with God in a peaceful way. As we develop peace within ourselves first, we can reflect peace into the world around us. The Latter-day Peace Studies Presents Come Follow Me podcast seeks to assist listeners in their approach to scripture by providing nonviolent interpretation. Our hope is that we can integrate the teachings of the scriptures into our efforts to find peace within ourselves and proclaim peace in the world. Welcome back to Latter-day Peace Studies Presents Come Follow Me. I'm Marianne. And I'm Dan. And this week we are beginning the Book of Moroni, the last book in the Book of Mormon. And we are in chapters one through six, which are made up of about two and a half pages of text. (laughs) We have a very small section. Usually we have so much that we're trying to cover in a section. And then this section, I feel like it's very concise. And I think part of the reason that this section here is so concise is because Moroni tells us that he didn't think he was going to write this section. He thought Ether's parting words were kind of his also, but he he says that he continues to wander and have more time than he thought he would. And so he's going to make the most of it by writing a few more things. And he says that perhaps they may be of worth unto my brother in the Lamanites in some future day, according to the will of the Lord. So I think that Moroni has this sense of some things that are going to be useful for the, you know, organization of the church going forward. But I don't know that he has a clear picture of exactly how these are going to be used. And, you know, I think the Lord has given him some, some broad strokes and he's, he's, and given him some commandments and he's doing his best to fulfill them without knowing exactly how they're going to play out. Mm -hmm. So do you have more thoughts about that? No, I, th- I think that that's a pretty good assessment. I mean, there, there's a handful of things in here that kind of stuck out to me, but I, I, I think I agree that overall it's um, interesting that they split this into its own week. Yes. Yeah. This does seem like a very small block of text to spend a whole week studying. Perhaps just because we're on that schedule where I don't know if this falls in an off week or an on week, or if that's universal in the church, which week is on or off for Come Follow Me to maybe ensure that we're we're going to cover Ether 12 mm-hmm. and Moroni 7, right? <laughs> like so so no matter what, like that Sunday school teacher should be able to fit, you know, fit this in with one of those, right? Yeah. So that we can we can do both. Maybe so. They didn't seem to really think about that in all of their other splits though. So <laughs> Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure about the the decisions on that. So Jesus gives the disciples the power to give the Holy Ghost. And um, this does seem like a repeat from 3rd Nephi. Like, I feel like we already got this story, but Moroni wanted to make sure that he talked clearly about the authority and the power to lay their hands and bestow the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that it was just to to the disciples and not heard by the multitude. So this might have been something that was passed to him by the three Nephites who ministered to him and like some of the things that they told him about Jesus' visit. So do you have comments on that? Not specifically. I I think it's interesting that we get maybe the only reference to the Nephite disciples as apostles here in chapter two, because he he talks about, you know, you shall power to that to him on whom you shall lay your hands, you shall give the whole gift of the Holy Ghost, and in my name you shall give it, for thus do mine apostles. And so prior to this, they've only ever been referred to as the Nephite disciples, but this is a time when they're referred to as apostles, which I think is interesting that that is on his mind, uh, or at least that he chooses to use a word which, which you know, again, what's the, the calling of an apostle, right? It's someone who's sent forth. So interesting to me that that's, that's used here. Yeah, I hadn't caught that on the first reading. Good, good spotting. And in chapter three, Moroni outlines that they pray to the Father in the name of Christ and lay their hands upon whoever they are ordaining as elders, priests, and teachers, that they are ordained to preach repentance and remission of sins through Jesus Christ. And I also love this phrase, by the endurance of faith on his name to the end. Amen. And like, that's 
that's how we repent actually is through faith. That's why faith comes before repentance because we can't repent until we have exercised faith. Yeah. And that, yeah, the endurance of faith, we could think about that as the, the binding trust. It's the ability for us to continue to rely on him. I think just like a interesting note in verse four, it talks about how they were ordained. Uh, they ordained them by the power of the Holy Ghost, right? And they ordained them priests and teachers. And I, I thought that was kind of an interesting thing. But it turns out there's, there's a lot of commentary on this. There's there's multiple people who talk about this. Uh, James E. Talmadge, uh, Joseph Fielding Smith, a couple, couple other people who mentioned this. And one of the interesting things is that, you know, the, the people, they're like, well, we don't know exactly they probably had the Melchizedek priesthood. They may have had the Aaronic priesthood. But one of the guys said, uh, did, did Moroni mean to say that he ordained them by the power of the priesthood? Well, probably not, right? They, they're ordained by the power of the priesthood, but there's a relationship between the priesthood and the Holy Ghost, right? Because without the Holy Ghost, we can't have revelation. Without revelation, we can't have the priesthood because the priesthood gives us the authority to speak for God. And so the Holy Ghost is, this is Joseph Smith, the Holy Ghost is God's messenger to administer in all those priesthoods. That's an interesting thing that I think we don't often think about. They, you know, when we talk about the priesthood, it's kind of focused on Jesus and maybe ordinances, something like that. But I think that this might also tie into what we see in section 132 that's talking about the Holy Spirit of promise relative to ordinances and to, again, that deals a lot with priesthood and ordinances and things have to be sealed by the Holy Spirit of, Spirit of promise. So all of that kind of plays in here. Now, maybe I'm just pulling a lot out of uh, this. This is a little bit of blood from the stone, given the, given the amount of text we have, but uh, interesting to note. I also thought it was interesting that the word priesthood was not actually used in these few early chapters. Yeah. So uh, again, obviously it, it is implied but it is not actually said. And when he says the power by the power of the Holy ghost, which was in them. And I just, I liked that emphasis on it, on the Holy ghost being the, the conveyor of power. And that as we know, power in the priesthood is only gained through making covenants and then righteously keeping those covenants, righteous living. And so as we were teaching our children the other day, that there are priesthood keys, which are the, you know, permission to administer. And then there's priesthood authority, which could be a continuation of that, right? The permission to administer, but power in the, and those are, those are received, you know, through others from Jesus Christ and through his, his servants. But the power in the priesthood cannot be conferred. It has to be primarily like it has, you have to be the primary source of your priesthood power mm -hmm. because it comes only through willingly making those covenants and keeping them through righteous living. And thus priesthood power is available to anyone who makes covenants with God and keeps them. They have priesthood power. I don't have a lot to say about four and five, except to say that it's interesting that, uh, you know, the manner of elders and priests administering the flesh and blood of Christ under the church, right? That's that seems very literal for everything else that we, we know about the sacrament. But uh, yeah, that's just, again, I, I have so many questions about translation and interpretation, and I, I don't think it's wrong, obviously. It's just that maybe we don't use that sort of language all the time. So, Well, I think they use it more in different Christian denominations. Right, but I'm talking about our denomination. Right, I know. I'm just saying, I, I think that that is common Christian language, though not necessarily the one that our denomination uses frequently. And I think it might be, uh, this is totally conjecture, and this is just something I thought of at this moment. So take it for whatever it's worth. But I think it tends to be more of the Catholic church that would be the very literal, like flesh and blood transubstantiation kind of thing. Yeah. And so perhaps our denomination in an effort to distance ourselves from Catholicism, which was a big part of our practice, especially during the 20th century, may have gotten away from that more literal using of words, kind of toning it down a bit. Yeah, I, I think that's correct based off history. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the, the one thing that as I was studying the sacrament prayers and comparing them when Jesus gives the sacrament prayers to the Nephites, to the children of Lehi in third Nephi 18, the prayers are exactly the same except for 
bread and wine switched out. But in our current sacrament prayers and the one for the ones from here, there are a couple of small differences. And I was just kind of looking at what those differences were and kind of meditating on possible reasons for those differences. In the prayer for the bread, we are we express willingness to take upon ourselves the name of Jesus Christ and keep his commandments. Those two elements actually aren't present in the prayer on the water or wine. But the other elements are the the bread or the water or wine is blessed and sanctified to the souls of those who partake of it. And they do it in remembrance and they witness that they remember. So remember is in both of them. And then having his spirit to be with us is in both of them. Do you make anything of those differences or similarities? I think we talked a little bit about it in third Nephi, right? That the, the bread, I mean, both, both of them have remember, right? But that the, the witness, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I kind of had the idea of like solid concrete bread, you know, being sort of more past oriented and then the liquid chaotic water being more future oriented. I, I, maybe that holds up. Maybe it doesn't. I like that imagery, mm -hmm. but I don't, I mean, they're, they're to remember Christ's presence with us, right? They are Jesus with us. And so when we take the sacrament, you know, sometimes we're like, oh, well, this is how we, you know, cap off our repentance. You know, it's like, this is everything else is sort of, it's like everything's pending and, and you just really need to take the sacrament and then all those, uh, you know, redemptions will go through. That's yeah. kind of how I've, I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about it that way. I, I don't really, I don't really believe that that is the exact your method. Your repentance is not full until the next time you take the sacrament. Yeah. And I, I get, I get that, that general gist and you laugh, but people have said no, that. I, and... I'm laughing because that feels familiar. Like I, I understand that. I don't know that I've ever heard anyone express it explicitly like that. But oh, I've heard it. You've explicitly. heard it explicit? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And again, there, there's an aspect of it that like, I, I get where they're coming from and, and why that is like, why there's some piece behind that but it's not like otherwise you know if you die uh moments after taking the sacrament right unless it's like right. as you are finishing you know ingesting <laughs> then you have to suffer for a little bit of the sins that you committed right. um, yeah I, I think that that is uh not what we we should take from here i like some of these things in chapter six mm-hmm I ask myself some questions of, of verse one. What does it mean to be worthy and how can we bring forth fruit? Not something that I think we need to answer, right? But just an interesting thought, you know, because I, I think it's kind of given an answer in verse two, where it says they come forth with a broken heart and contrite spirit and witness unto the church that they truly repented of their sins, right? Oh, well, that would, I mean, what does it mean to be worthy? Well, to be willing to come forth with a broken heart and contrite spirit, right? That's all... That's all you can have, right? That's all you can give. Everything else is already God's. So the only way to be of any worth is to bring what you can bring, which is a broken heart and contrite spirit. So, Yeah, that stood out to me too, that it was all about their repentance and humility and willingness and not about their perfection or even their good works, <laughs> that, that it was about their attitude. That they have to take upon them the name of Christ and determine to serve him to the end. And then so after they're baptized, they were wrought upon and cleansed by the power of the Holy Ghost. And I, I love that because it, it really gives me the feeling of like, it's not this passive just receiving the Holy Ghost. It's, it's the Holy Ghost wrought upon them and cleansed them. Like it's, it's a, it's a working, it's a struggle, it's a purifying and like it, it works on us, right? It softens our heart and that, that takes some work on the Holy Ghost's part and on our part as well. So I just loved that. Yeah. And then their, their names are taken after they're baptized and they receive the Holy Ghost, their names are taken. So they keep records that they might be remembered remember important and nourished 
by the good word of God. So, so that there's a record of it and so that they are in continued contact, right? That they continue to receive fellowship and ministration and relationships and community. That's an important part of their experience in the gospel. And they meet together off to fast and pray and speak with one another concerning the welfare of their souls. So it doesn't necessarily say weekly or even on the Sabbath. Do we really talk much about Sabbath observance in the Book of Mormon? I think that it's not ringing any bells. They, Yes, we do, but not much. <laughs> yeah, there is some of that. The, the thing that stuck out to me is that we, we, we get these things and we're talked to, they're talking about this, but by the time that Moroni is around, who is the church? Or is this all just tied back into the, the sort of revelations of Christ that maybe didn't make it into, you know, the end of third Nephi? I think this is more of how the church operated during those years of peace. Yeah. I would agree with that, except then we get seven, eight, and nine. <laughs> And seven, eight, and nine are all Mormon talking to in a synagogue. And it's like, yeah. who are these people? Because <laughs> I thought there were no righteous ones. So is he is he going to speak just in whichever church will have him? Because yeah. that wouldn't well, surprise me. But Mormon Mormon doesn't necessarily call them all to re- – I know we're getting a little ahead of ourselves for next week. But he doesn't just like call them all to repentance. He he says, I judge these things of you because you are the peaceable followers of Christ. Like there is a contingent that Mormon – during Mormon's lifetime yeah. that were the peaceable followers of Christ. Yeah, he, he just doesn't talk about them in his book. No, he doesn't really. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that that is an interesting question about why he wouldn't. I mean, if I you know. just read, and this is, you know, if you just read the Book of Mormon in the Book of Mormon, right? Mm-hmm. I don't think you get the idea that there's any church body outside of Mormon and Moroni. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't. And so it's kind of interesting to see that, well, actually, no, there there are some, right? Yeah. And so again, when you look at and you read the scriptures and you don't see things, when when Mormon's like, well, there's only 24 of us. It's like, okay, does that mean all the rest of you are, are gone? Like every yeah. single Nephite died. It's like, well, is that really what you mean? Or is it is it from from Mormon's perspective? Is Mormon just giving an account of, you know, this group? And so I don't know. But just an interesting thing to note, and I think it actually reflects like a very real aspect of record keeping. And it's interesting how we get the second sort of perspective, but we only get it from Moroni, or we only get it because of Moroni, so and through Moroni, which, again, is just, just very interesting. So when it comes to the composition of the Book of Mormon, that, that stuck out to me. Well, and he, Moroni said, going back here to chapter one, that they will put to death every, ne- the Lamanites will put to death every Nephite that will not deny the Christ. Now, how would he know that unless there were some that mm-hmm. the Lamanites caught who would not deny the Christ and they put them to death? So yeah. clearly there there are still lingering wanderers trying trying to survive, but it peters out. So I do think chapter six is mostly describing how the church operated in third and fourth Nephi, but that takes us right up to Mormon's lifetime. So I, I yeah. think he's just describing the pattern that was set during that time that they then tried to hold to as people dwindled away and died. It doesn't take long before Mormons like, well, everyone's wicked. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, but I think also important here is in chapter six is that Moroni never says we. He's always talking in the third person. Yeah. So he it's says true. they and there and this this was the ideal and not necessarily yeah. the current practice. So Yeah. I also love verse eight. As oft as they repented and sought forgiveness with real intent, they were forgiven. So this this emphasis, especially in a community, on forgiveness and being willing to repent and try to make things right, that's something that Zion has to have because we don't we can't become perfect overnight. It's going to take time. We have to have patience with ourselves and with others as we work toward living in a Zion-like society. A Zion-like society has to be forgiving 
and not just instantly expect to be in a place where no one has to ever forgive anything. Any more thoughts on that? No, I think that that wraps it up. All right. Well, they they also say that they conduct their meetings after the manner of the workings of the Spirit and by the power of the Holy Ghost. So this does make me wish we had a little bit more detail here to see how similar it might be to sort of the the charismatic church, the primitive church of Peter and Paul and the other apostles and like the early Christian church in the Middle East area. So do you have do you have any thoughts on that before we leave it? Nope. <laughs> I, okay, I mean, I just, just my thought. I, it's probably the reason that they have to conduct those things is because, again, who knows how often they can actually gather together. So when they gather, they just have to follow the spirit and figure out what are we going to talk about? What are we going to read? You know, administer the, the Lord's Supper. And then where do we go now? Yeah. Yeah. What needs to be done? What needs to be addressed? What do people need this week? You know, I can see that. So it's a it's a beautiful pattern. I think it's important that Moroni included these pieces for us. And I also think it's beautiful that he addresses it to the Lamanites, that this probably gave him some hope and light to be reaching toward during these very dark and lonely times. I'm sure describing some of this community together must have been kind of heartbreaking for him to wish that he had something like that in his life. So cherish your communities that you're a part of. I think that does it for us this week. Uh, We have a big thank you to our editors, Kyle and Ben, for all the hard work they put into the podcast. If you would like to be a part of the Latter-day Peace Studies project, you can look for our Facebook page, Latter-day Nonviolence, Pacifism, and Peace Studies. We have links in the show notes. We also have a website, latterdaypeacestudies.org, and you can go there to find other ways to be involved in our project. For Latter-day Peace Studies, I'm Marianne. And I'm Dan. We'll see you next week.